It's week 29 in the Bible Challenge, and we're continuing in the book of Proverbs. As we discussed last week, uh, the Proverbs start out with several chapters that talk about uh, the personification of wisdom and then move into a whole set of practical precepts for good living. Here we are in chapter 4, and chapter 4 comprises basically an exhortation to acquire wisdom and sets forth the classic wisdom literature doctrine of two ways. The two ways that one can live. One is to seek God's will and do God's will. This is the path of wisdom. The other is to seek one's own will. This is the path of folly. The search of wisdom in chapter 4 here is portrayed in terms of a parent's loving guidance and a child's loving response. Wisdom requires a response, but it is wisdom which first acts. That is, wisdom is revealed by God, whereas knowledge may be sought by humans. The theme that was set forth back in chapter 2 of the two ways of life, following God or not, is developed and reinforced using popular imagery, such as that of the way or pathway to walk or to stumble. Chapters 5 and 7 include warnings about adultery. There are four interludes found in chapter 6 which comprise practical admonitions which bear no connection with what proceeds and follows regarding adultery. The warnings, however, are not stated in negative terms alone. For example, at chapter 5, verse 15, the warnings are stated in terms of the value of fidelity as an expression of love and of the completeness of relationship with the beloved. This prologue to the whole book reaches its climax in chapter 8, in which the personified wisdom speaks to recommend herself and her teaching. She is to be honored for her universal call, her truth, integrity, and value, her intellectual gifts, her favors, and her priority, including being present at creation. Wisdom appeals to be heeded. Following this recital of virtues and appeal, chapter 9 then sets forth contrasting invitations to banquets, fellowship with or participation in wisdom or folly, wisdom's banquet or folly's banquet. The invitations are interrupted by six sayings which contrast the wise and the scoffer on the basis of teachability, whether they uh, will respond to wisdom or not. And then we get the first collection of Proverbs, beginning at chapter 10, and this continues to chapter 22. There are 375 Proverbs included in this section. Chapters 10 through 15 are marked by a continual presence of what is called antithetical parallelism. That is, Proverbs stated in terms of contrasts. Chapter 11 teaches about justice in business dealings. Chapter 12 introduces the theme of a woman of worth, and this theme is going to be developed later in chapter 31. In chapter 14, the identity of wisdom is blurred, using a phrase which can either mean the wisest women or the wisdom of women. This blurring is probably intentional and points to what's going to happen in chapter 31. In chapter 14, we get this motif of house building, literary motif, which is repeated in chapter 31 of the woman who builds her house. Chapter 16 switches to what is called synonymous or synthetic parallelism, in which a truth is repeated in another form. Uh, teachings are found, well, sayings are, are found here about the Lord and the King, and they're grouped together, leading to the tradition that chapters 10 to 22 compromise or comprise Solomonic wisdom, that Solomon, the wise king, had a hand in the composition of these Proverbs. Teachings are found here uh, regarding family relationships, chapter 17, the proper use of speech, chapter 18, righteousness despite the temptations of poverty, poverty, chapter 19, 
chapter 20, we get teachings that are not grouped thematically. They're kind of random. 21, sayings about the king, again, as we found in chapter 16. 22 focuses on the need uh, to maintain a reputation, a good reputation, and how a reputation outlives a person. The second half of chapter 22 is the locus for the switch in the form of the book to a series of sayings of the wise. This section bears a strong resemblance to an Egyptian wisdom book, the instruction of Amen Amenemope, which dated to the reign of Pharaoh Ramses II. That's the Pharaoh at the time of Moses. Uh, the parallelism between the Egyptian source and what we find in this uh, section of the Bible reflects that wisdom literature was a genre throughout the ancient Near East and is not an exclusively Jewish phenomenon. Now, when we get to the Psalms again, we are repeating Psalms 11 through 16, and I would refer you back to the summaries, either the written summaries or the videos, for weeks two and three of this Bible challenge. Moving forward then, we go into St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now, I just called it St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So the first question we have to ask is, did Paul write this letter? Or was it written by somebody else in his name? This ancient practice of writing using the name of your master, writing as a disciple of the master, was not considered to be plagiarism of any kind. It was considered to be a complement to the master's thought and an extension of his thought. But we can best understand Ephesians here as an encyclical letter. What I mean by that is a letter that's intended for circulation amongst the churches in Asia. There is an early tradition throughout the church that Paul wrote the letter, but in modern scholarship there have been questions raised about whether Paul wrote this or whether a disciple wrote it. The tradition of this Pauline uh, use was prevalent in the early church. The reason scholars have questioned it more recently is how the language is used. The actual Greek used in Ephesians is not like the Greek used in the letters that nobody would dispute Paul wrote. Uh, there are differences in vocabulary, in sentence structure. This may uh, reflect different authorship. It is conventional to refer to the letter as one written by Paul, and there's no problem in saying that. We just need to bear in mind that either his style evolved considerably, or somebody else was taking his thinking and expanding it. More important than the issues of language and style, however, is how the teaching in Ephesians relates to other parts of the letters of Paul. In other Pauline letters, the church is described in terms of local community. In Ephesians, the church is described as a universal phenomenon of cosmic extent embodying creation. Now, this could well represent an evolution in Paul's thinking, or it could represent an evolution in Pauline thought as expanded by another author. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This would argue, this language, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, would argue for some distance in time from the time of Paul's life. Uh, we can compare uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, in which Jesus is described by Paul as the only foundation of the church. Significantly, Ephesians develops the understanding of the church as Christ's body made up of members, and this may represent an extension of the teaching found at 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. The concern expressed in those earlier letters about the relationship between Gentile converts and Jews is absent in Ephesians. In Ephesians, Gentile and Jew are described as reconciled to God in one body through the cross. That's chapter 2, verse 16. Now, this may represent no more than a development in thought, but it may also re 
reflect later composition. Ephesians, and this is significant, Ephesians is not concerned with the second coming of Jesus, but with present day living as sharing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believers have been made alive, chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, and a long future for them in the church is envisaged. Ephesians is similar in some linguistic aspects to Colossians, which most scholars would assign to Paul, but the emphases are different between the two. The focus in Colossians is on Christology, about who is Jesus, what is Jesus in the scheme of salvation. In Ephesians, the focus is on ecclesiology, the theology of what the church is, what the church is called to be. The description of the church as the bride of Christ and the exalt, exalted view of marriage may be contrasted to the discussion of marriage found in 1 Corinthians 7. And so again, we see an evolution in thinking here. Now, regardless of these points of difference and similarity, the teaching in Ephesians is to be accepted as genuinely Pauline, whether he wrote it by his hand or not. The reliance on other Pauline letters whether written by his hand or not, and the relationship to Colossians suggests a later date of composition, probably about A.D. 80 to 100. And scholars therefore consider Ephesians to be a remembrance of Paul's teaching within the believing community. Believers consider the teaching to be divinely inspired and in continuity with the teaching found in Paul. The letter is more than a theological discourse, written in the context of thought which includes combat with Gnostic beliefs, early Gnostic beliefs, with Hellenistic Judaism, that is Judaism amongst Greek-speaking people, Second Temple Judaism, which we've discussed before, when the temple was rebuilt under Herod, there's a different view on how things uh, work in between God and his people than is found earlier when the first temple is built under Solomon. Uh, Second Temple Judaism, for example, is more focused on, oh, the shape of creation, what we call cosmogony, than on rules for living. Uh, Second Temple Judaism would include the community that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls, the so-called Qumran community, and the certain philosophical speculations we would find in Greek thinking known as Neoplatonism. So we get the writings, for example, of Philo of Alexandria being a Neoplatonic philosopher within a Jewish context. And Ephesians is more speaking to that world than to the world of a couple decades earlier uh, Ephesians is structured into a first half, chapters 1 through the end of uh, 3, which is an extended prayer of intercession for believers. The structure parallels that found in Jewish and early Christian devotional literature, blessing, thanksgiving, prayer of intercession, concluding doxology. The second half, chapters 4 through 6, is a series of exhortations to Christians to behave in keeping with their exalted status as children of the light, as members of the church, as members of the household of God, the bride of Christ. Now, we can look at structure here in terms of message points. So, we start out with address and greetings, God's plan revealed and accomplished, thanksgiving prayer and intercession, how believers were once dead but now live in Christ, how Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ. Paul is now interpreting the mystery revealed by God. We get prayer and doxology. Remember doxology is a prayer of praise, reciting the glory of God. We get an exhortation to unity in the church we get contrasts being made between Christian and non-Christian conduct as an example of what life in Christ looks like. And we get a code of conduct for the household of God. 
Now these household codes, the one here in Ephesians shows up starting at 5, chapter 5, verse 21. These household codes found in Paul's letters and in 1 Peter, uh, these household codes are what some scholars consider to be additions to Paul. These codes reflect Greco-Roman social teaching, and they are depicting a Christian household and the church, therefore, in terms of a hierarchically structured social unit. Such codes may represent an apologetic, an argument against pagan accusations that Christian, Christianity undermines the public order. Uh, they may be just there to say, see, we are good citizens as well, and we are moral, upright people as well. Finally, we get Christian life characterized in chapter 6 as warfare with evil. And we get a conclusion and a blessing. This is a long theological discourse. This is not what we would call a pastoral letter written to a particular community with advice or responses to questions they have written. Whether it's Paul or somebody else, they are thinking aloud, recording it, and sending it around as a structured teaching for a young church that is struggling in a world filled with beliefs in conflict with what Jesus has revealed. In that respect, then, Ephesians is very much echoed in our day and age in our society as the church struggles against many of the same Gnostic beliefs that Paul or one writing in his name struggled against in the first century. May God bless you in your continue, continued spiritual struggles to follow Jesus Christ. May he continue to enlighten you. Amen.